Welcome to Shooting Straight with AMF.com. I'm Frank Benetier, the editor in chief, the NRA's America's First Freedom. Today we have the incredible pleasure speaking with Robert Cotrell. Now he's the author of a, a book that I just I just loved, uh, to trust the people with arms, and he's also a, a professor of law and history at uh, George Washington University. Now since I read this book, Robert, I wanted to speak to you because I just haven't seen somebody put all this case law and the history together. Um, in such a succinct and readable way as you did here. I'm wondering, what led you to writing this book? There's a lot of Second Amendment books out there. And of course, these big Supreme Court decisions have occurred. Um, so there's a lot out there to, to dig into. But why did you think this book was necessary now? And what led you to write it? Well, I think that uh, we have gotten uh, a distorted picture uh, of the Second Amendment Largely, I would say, from the gun control movement and the press. And, and the press, uh, certainly over the last 30, 40 years, has been the prime mover or supporter yeah. of the gun control movement. And they have pushed uh, in the minds of many, not, not the majority of Americans, but, but of many, uh, the idea that the Second Amendment was always understood to be a militia-only right and not a general right of the population. Um, and... You see that with a number of people who've made commentaries on Heller saying that Heller came out of nowhere, uh, that, uh, you know, that the Supreme Court made this up, that there had always been an understanding of the Second Amendment as supplying only to the militia. Uh, so uh, uh, I decided with uh, Brandon Deming, uh, do a book that would look at the history and the law uh, and, and see what was, in fact, uh, were in fact the facts uh, with respect to uh, the general understanding of the Second Amendment and what the courts had said about it uh, and other matters that, that were, uh, were pertinent. Uh, so we, get, we did research, and both of us had written previously on the su subject of the Second Amendment. Uh, and as we did research, we saw more and more that the militia only view um, was a myth and was one that was largely invented uh, out of whole cloth. Interestingly enough, not originally designed with respect or with respect to the Second Amendment, but with respect to state right to keep and bear arms provisions in state constitutions. Um, so we started to to write that, and more and more as we looked at the actual cases that had occurred before Hel Heller. Uh, as well as the history of the adoption of the Second Amendment. And uh, I would also add the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is the vehicle by which the court has applied uh, the Bill of Rights to the states. Uh, and if, as we look at the history of both amendments, uh, it's very clear that uh, the people who drafted and ratified uh, those amendments uh, were thinking of the right to bear arms as a right of individuals. And so we wrote that in part to set the, set the record straight and also in part because it's a, a fascinating story, a fascinating history that we wanted to, wanted to share. The interesting aspect, I guess, of my own personal biography, um, most people who are, are somewhat strong supporters of the Second Amendment right uh, will tell you that they grew up in families with guns and uh, you know, that they went hunting as, as children and so forth and so on. None of that applies to me. I grew up in New York City. Uh, my, family didn't, uh, my family didn't have guns. My father had been in the Army at, during World War II, and you know, he told me about the, the Springfield rifle and the M1 Garand and so forth. Uh, but, you know, again, we grew up in Manhattan. Uh, you know, didn't uh, know, uh, have guns. Uh, I started becoming something of a supporter and became interested in the Second Amendment at roughly age 12. And three things uh, hit me at just the same time. Um, one, uh, I saw the movie, I think it was made in 1959 or 60 or whatever it was, uh, The Diary of Anne Frank. Uh, Again, late 50s movie, I think Shelley Winters was in it and a number of other uh, stars of that year. Um, I also happened to see a, uh, a book, uh, not a book, but a pamphlet or an essay or whatever, 
what if Otto Frank and Frank's father had had a gun? Um, you know, and that sort of that set me to thinking. And interesting thing about that, I didn't fully appreciate that uh, that particular essay till much later in life. I visited Amsterdam and I went to the Anne Frank house and. One of the things that's interesting is to get to the attic where they were staying, you have to climb a very steep and narrow staircase uh, where you have to hold on to the banister uh, to get up. Uh, basically, it's not a position that can be rushed, uh, you know, by several people coming in uh, at the same time. Uh, that, all, that only accelerated my, my thinking uh, later on, uh, you know, what if well, they had been armed and managed to get away uh, at that night? Um, you know, especially if you stop and think, uh, uh, they were captured, I believe, in the summer of uh, 44, late 44. Market Garden, uh, the Allied attempt to go through Holland into uh, the Netherlands, into Germany, occurred in, what, the fall of 44. Might they have been able to get out and get to the ang Anglo-American lines? It's a question. Yeah. I don't Hitler, of course, had disarmed the Jews in, in Germany. I, but I'm not yeah. sure about where Anne Frank was, whether what had taken place there with, with that part well, of well, some of it. They had disarmed uh, the Dutch population, but if there were enough uh, that were there, uh, you know, might some filter down to them or mm -hmm. not? Might some have been hidden? You know, it's a question. The other thing that I read when I was about 12 or whatnot uh, was the case of, um, well, a book by a man named Robert Williams who wrote Negroes with Guns, uh, a book in about, uh, Williams was an NAACP organizer uh, in uh, North Carolina in the 1950s, and he was working on voter registration, and the Klan uh, sent threats to him. And what he did was to organize, to turn his NAACP chapter into an NRA gun club uh, mm -hmm. and thus able to get some of the surplus World War II weapons. Uh, the bottom line was when the Klan saw that they were armed, uh, they decided they didn't want any part of it. Uh, you know, so again, those three things hit me uh, at roughly 12. Oh, also, uh, I read the, uh, the Boy Scout manual at that point. Uh, had a, uh, uh, a section on the Bill of Rights, and it talked about the Second Amendment, and that was sort of a hedge against uh, tyranny. So all of those things hit me at, you know, roughly a very uh, young age, 12 uh, years old, um, long before I, you know, ever, ever fired a gun. So, you know, my, uh, yeah, I do, uh, you know, I sort of came to these views uh, fairly early in life, but not because I was duck hunting, uh, you know, when I was a kid. Intellectually, because you're reading in New yeah. York City. The mm -hmm. truth is there, you have a chance. Well, yeah. When did you first then uh, take your second memorize in your hands? When, when did you first shoot? Well, let's see. I guess, uh, you know, I, uh, I joined the Army National Guard right after college. And so, uh, you know, went shooting, uh, obviously, you know, trained in marksmanship and whatnot. Um, and then uh, as a graduate student, I... Uh, took up shooting, uh, you know, went to, uh, uh, you know, started, uh, going to various ranges in Connecticut and so forth. And so I've been a shooter ever since, but I, you know, I didn't really start that until, uh, when I was 22 years old or so. Well, and, and changing times and demographics out there too, as, as more people, um, take, I mean, you look at the surveys and, and the number of Hispanics mm -hmm. and, and, and blacks and Asians and, and now uh, Jews after uh, the horror on October 7th well, are realizing this freedom and taking it up. Uh, very much so. Very much so. Um, I think one of the things the, the Second Amendment, a uh, challenge the Second Amendment movement has uh, is how do you translate that into political support uh, for the right to, to bear arms? And that's, that's a complex issue that, uh, you know, we might want to talk about it some some other point. Well, that's why joining the NRA is so important. 
We do need that association to, to, mm-hmm. to be out there fighting for for this freedom. Yes. Right. The intellectual understanding and such as you uh, get into and the, the trust of the people with arms, it, it's just foundational and important. Now, academia, uh, and I found this interesting, uh, over time and from the late 60s uh, up until as this militia argument was, was taken up, was actually in, in part through papers and different journals starting to refute this claim that it was a militia-based right, not an individual right. Of course, uh, anyone who looks to the history of it, to the founding period especially, sees that it clearly was meant to be and is and has been. Um, but I found it interesting how that argument was taking place, not in, in popular culture, um, but actually in, in various law journals. Uh, yes. Um, you know, I think that a number of people in law schools uh, played an important role in, uh, in, in basically showing the evidence that refuted the militia-only view. Uh, most importantly, of course, I think was Sanford Levinson of the University of, of Texas, um, who is a member of the law faculty at Texas and also the political science faculty there. Uh, and he wrote in, in 1989, the embarrassing Second Amendment, uh, saying, look, uh, people in law schools need to take the Second Amendment seriously, that the individual rights claims are, are in fact, quite strong. Uh, I would also add to the list of academics who, who made a significant difference, uh, uh, Raymond Diamond of Louisiana State University, uh, Nelson Lund, uh, currently of the George Mason University. And also a number of historians, uh, Joyce Malcolm, uh, also of uh, George Mason University School of Law, who's a historian of Tudor Stewart, England, uh, wrote uh, uh, To Keep and Bear Arms, looking at the English uh, antecedents uh, to the American, uh, American right to bear arms. Uh, Leonard Levy, the, uh, well, probably the dean of post-war constitutional historian. Uh, indicated his view that he thought it was an individual right. Uh, so uh, uh, Robert Shallow, uh, uh, an intellectual historian uh, who focuses on, I believe, the 18th century, uh, had also written to that effect. So a number of people in, uh, in uh, both the legal academy and, and history and political science uh, had, in fact, uh, done extensive research, research indicating uh, that the individual rights view was, was essentially correct. Uh, I would say not essentially, quite clearly, right? Um, but it's funny, I remember I was in, I got the chance to sit in the, during the Heller decision uh, in the press section in the Supreme Court as, they, as the oral hearings took place there. And I was sitting next to a reporter from Associated Press. And when Kennedy kind of, Justice Kennedy at the time, kind of tipped his hand where he was probably going to vote, um, she just muddled, uh, mumbled under her breath, oh no, you know, they couldn't believe that the media's fake narrative was being pulled out from under them, that this clearly was an individual right, and there it is. But, okay, a- as a, a history professor, um, a law professor, it must be surprising to you to look back at the context of history and see it wasn't until 2008 that this right um, made it to the Supreme Court and was adjudicated I and mean, it was decided, of course, it is indiv- in, an individual right. It, that surprised you at all? Um, not really, because if you look at, there's a reason, I think, why the Supreme Court didn't get to the Second Amendment until very late. Um, the first has to do with the, the question, a uh, question that's known in, in, in legal circles as incorporation. Uh, incorporation means applying the Bill of Rights to the states. Um, the framers of the 14th Amendment, uh, which uh, is, is enacted or adopted finally in 1868, uh, had two aims in mind when they, they uh, enacted the 14th Amendment. One was to establish the principle of, of racial equality uh, uh, as a matter of constitutional law, uh, that, that government cannot treat people of different races uh, different or uh, unequal. Uh, the second objective was to actually to have the states protect fundamental rights, uh, particularly the rights found in the Bill of Rights. Uh, the Supreme Court early on basically decided we're not going to apply uh, the second part, uh, which is to uh, to have the states uh, uh, respect the Bill of Rights. And 
what actually had to happen in that area was it, the 14th Amendment is passed in 1868. Uh, the idea that the Bill of Rights would apply to the states is rejected uh, immediately thereafter. And basically, the Supreme Court spends the 20th century essentially reestablishing that principle on a case-by-case basis, as opposed to simply saying wholesale, uh, the 14th Amendment um, uh, protects uh, the bill, citizens from uh, violations of the Bill of Rights by the states. Um, so you don't have that wholesale adoption. Instead, what you have is a case-by-case method where the court decides, well, this particular provision of the Bill of Rights uh, does apply to the states. Um, now, if we consider gun control, gun control really until 1934, when you have the first federal gun control act, National Firearms Act, uh, gun control has historically been a state matter, uh, not a federal matter. That is, most restrictions on gun ownership uh, have come out of out of state uh, legislatures and not out of Congress. Uh, with the court saying. Uh, essentially accepting the doctrine that the Bill of Rights does not apply to the states, um, there's really no occasion for the court uh, to look at various state laws uh, that are arguably violative uh, of the right to bear arms. The first federal statute is 1934, and that brings about the case in in 1939 of United States versus Miller. Uh, And that was a curious case uh, because one only the government was held, heard before the Supreme Court. Uh, Miller and, uh, and his associates, who had been uh, uh, essentially freed by the district court, um, were, uh, were not represented uh, before the Supreme Court. So the court has an ex parte hearing on the question of a, a short-barreled shotgun and whether or not that's protected by the Second Amendment. Uh, and the Supreme Court, again, only hearing the government side, uh, basically says we don't have evidence that um, uh, that a short-barreled shotgun is a militia weapon. And a lot of people have mistaken that, somewhat deliberately, I would add, to say that, well, the court is saying that, uh, you know, only the militia is protected. Uh, no, the court was not saying that. They were saying weapons that are useful for the militia may be protected, but we don't know whether a sort of shotgun or short-barreled shotgun is one. But the basic story is that gun control is large, uh, until very recently, is largely a state matter, a matter of state law. And so there's, there's no opportunity, if the court adheres to that doctrine, there's no opportunity to, uh, to pronounce on the Second Amendment. Wasn't it also just considered to be an individual right, uh, by and large? through the 19th century, well into the 20th century, most people just saw it as an individual right? Well, yeah, but what we're looking at now is why is the court so late to the gate of, mm-hmm. of uh, talking about uh, the Second Amendment and looking at it as an individual right? And I think this doctrine of incorporation is a good part of the reason. But, you know, Well, didn't the, court, the first, wasn't the first, first amendment was first to be incorporated, right? It was like 1920? Yes. Uh, we we have the beginnings of incorporation uh, essentially in the 20s with the First Amendment. Uh, so yes, even that isn't really uh, the subject of judicial scrutiny until relatively late uh, in in the nation's history. Um, but what made Heller uh, and made District of Columbia so attractive and ultimately sort of broke the logjam, as it were, is the District of Columbia, of course, is federal territory. So a case could be brought uh, against uh, the handgun ban in the District of Columbia because we wouldn't have to worry about the incorporation doctrine or whether the Second Amendment applied to the states. And that uh, permitted a case where the court could unambiguously say uh, the Second Amendment is an individual right uh, and have also paved the way uh, for... uh, City of Chicago versus McDonald, and uh, rather the case against Chicago, which of course would be state action and not federal action. And that's the case that incorporated the Second Amendment to the states. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. You also wrote this book, I think, during a very interesting time because you were finishing the book 
just after New York State Rifle and Pistol Association first brew in the Supreme Court case that decided, yes, indeed, our Second Amendment rights do carry outside of our homes. That yes. must have been just a fascinating time for you to be finishing. Well, it was fascinating. It was also, it's rare for a historian to have a stop the presses moment. Uh, basically, um, we had, this was prior to Bruin, we had written, uh, basically written the book, uh, basically taking us from uh, the founding to Heller and McDonald. And we still thought, okay, we've done our work, you know, now just uh, dot a few I's, cross a few T's and, and get it out the door. And then we saw Bruin come. And we said, my goodness, we can't omit Bruin. This, you know, this is incredible. Uh, they're, you know, they're talking about uh, the right to carry outside the home. This is a whole new dimension, totally beyond what goes on in, in uh, uh, McDonald and, and, and Heller. Um, so we literally said, stop the presses. We got, we, you know, we have to wait to see what happens in Bruin and add that to the book. And again, uh, you know, as a historian and as, as a legal scholar, we rarely get that kind of almost journalistic stop the presses kind of moment. You're, you're living right in history here as this right gets adjudicated. And I find interesting too, and I, I try to make this point often, is that things are hardly over, that now that these, these three decisions have happened for the U.S. Supreme Court, that a lot of stuff has to be worked out through the courts of what this right actually does mean. Uh, the state of New York, for example, um, taking this sensitive place idea and throwing it really a, a wide net across much of the state, stopping people from carrying once again based on sensitive place mm -hmm. restrictions. Uh, that was well, you find intriguing as here we are in this critical constitutional period as we just came out with a book on the Second Amendment. Oh, yes. I mean, basically, we're, what we're doing is seeing a massive resistance, almost similar to the massive resistance you had in the 50s to school integration. Uh, you have uh, basically the Supreme Court making the decision, and then all sorts of local officials are basically thumbing their nose, saying, uh, we're not going to obey. We're going to throw up one roadblock after another, uh, you know, basically in the hope uh, that uh, we can get away with it or that the Supreme Court will go away somehow. Uh, it's incredible, incredible, and unfortunately uh, says an awful lot about lack of respect for the rule of law that we're seeing uh, in New York and California and, and, and other jurisdictions. Right. In Bruin, uh, uh, Justice Thomas literally said that the sensitive place restriction couldn't just apply to the whole uh, island of Manhattan, for example. Uh, they didn't go far, much farther than that, but they, they, were, they were starting the process, starting the conversation of exactly what is a sensitive place, a courtroom, of course, and and some other uh, very specific places, but it, it can't be something as broad as a city. No, it, it can't. Uh, and frankly, the way New York officials are trying to do it, they're trying to make it the whole state, uh, you know, in, in addition to the city. One of the things that's happened is, uh, I think a number of jurisdictions, and New York is perhaps the worst of them, um, lived uh, for almost a century, better than a century, actually, as if the Second Amendment simply didn't exist, that uh, their state was a Second Amendment free zone, and therefore they could enact any measure that they wanted. Um, and basically, Heller and McDonald came as a real shock to them. You know, the, the court is saying, yes, the Second Amendment exists, and it applies to you, uh, you know, which they're seeing with even greater force with, uh, with Bruin. Uh, so, uh, in some ways, they're, uh, you know, they're adjusting to a whole new constitutional universe uh, in terms of, you know, what the court will look at and, and how strictly the court will, uh, uh, will uh, examine uh, their activity. Uh, now, the question is, you know, will the court come back again and say, yeah, we really meant it. You've got to, uh, you know, you've got to obey. Uh, I think the court will, but. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Well, it takes time, right, for cases to find their way up through the court system. And they like to allow the circuit courts to fight it out before the Supreme Court sure. weighs in potentially. Um, and they did wait a long time before they weighed in with Bruin. Um, yes. Sometimes yeah. to the chagrin of certain justices who didn't like that they were weeding. I mean, that must have also surprised you that they waited even though uh, d different circuit courts were completely disagreeing with one another. 
Well, I think that um, the justices who supported the Second Amendment, uh, one, wanted to make sure that they had, uh, you know, a majority to go beyond uh, uh, McDonald. So in, in a sense, uh, I think they held their fire to some extent, uh, you know, until uh, they had sufficient number of justices who in fact agreed, you know, that we can go beyond or should go beyond McDonald. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a basic individual right, and that's where the court has come down. Um, what surprised me, it, especially getting to view uh, the proceedings, those hearings, was that there were five four decisions. Um, and you read the minority decisions in those two five four decisions, Heller and McDonald, you find it clear that those four justices in both cases saw it a completely different way. And not only that, but if they got a fifth vote at that time, um, they would reverse course and take in this individual right away. I, I think unquestionably, um, you know, there is a question this, you know, this is precarious. It's still in a precarious position there. Uh, there are jurists out there, uh, who would definitely vote to reverse if they, uh, if they had the opportunity. Uh, you know, so yeah. we're in this incredibly important constitutional period and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing it'll, it'll last the next generation or so as cases move up to the Supreme Court. Um, and, and I imagine you're going to have to update your book once in a while as this occurs Entirely. because there's just so much going on. Entirely possible. Uh, well, there yeah. you are. Uh, now, I'm also curious how, as you're a, a professor, um, a history and law professor at George Washington University, how are you being received with a book like this? Do you, you're, I mean, the academia is, is getting a lot of pushback from from the right today for being too far left, uh, are you getting pushed back at, because you've, you've looked at this right and, and clearly said, wait a second, it's individual right, which isn't the view of the far left. It's not the view of the far left, but uh, you know, I think the extent to which academia is populated solely by the far, far left has been overstated. I think most people in academia are, are mainstream liberals, but they're not, uh, not the far left as, as such. But, you know, what's amazing, if you look at um, the people who, uh, the academics in the 90s, the scholars in the 90s who said, wait, this really is an individual right. Uh, what's really interesting is uh, probably a majority of them were, in fact, liberals, uh, you know, who said, yeah, you know, there really is something. I mean, let me give you a famous example. Uh, Larry Tribe of of Harvard, uh, who definitely uh, you know is, is liberal uh, and is one of the foremost liberal constitutional scholars, uh, revised his casebook on const or horn, uh, treatise, I should say, on constitutional law. Uh, previously, he had said, um, you know, it's a right of the militia, not a right of, of the individual, uh, and. His, the latest edition or the last edition of his, uh, his treatise, he said, you know, I've read uh, the scholarship and I'm convinced that it is an individual. Uh, Alan Dershowitz at one point said, uh, said the same thing. So, uh, you know, I think people who are intellectually honest and look uh, at the scholarship or look at the original sources, uh, in fact, do acknowledge uh, that it is a right of the individual. That's what a historian should do. Um, and that's what a classically liberal person should do is look to these rights as what they are uh, and not want to take that from the people. Um, so yeah, I, when we're using the word liberal, we're also talking the, the political definition of today versus the classical liberal definition of what that means. Um, uh -huh. But it, well, it's interesting. Even, you know, even, I mean, we can think of classical liberalism, which, you know, we normally think of uh, mo it's very interesting. What we call conservative in the United States, most Europeans call liberal. We think of it as classical liberal. But, you know, if we think of a simple, uh, you know, modern American liberalism is sort of starting with uh, Franklin Roosevelt moving forward. Uh, you know, one of the strongest statements uh, in support of the Second Amendment uh, was made by Hubert Humphrey uh, in 1960. Uh, you know, the, uh, basically saying the, the Second Amendment is, 
is a hedge against potential tyranny. Uh, uh, John Kennedy uh, said uh, said similar things uh, about it. I think it's only uh, well. In fact, let's look at the uh, at the NRA's history. You know, one of uh, the NRA's strongest supporters and the person who set up uh, the Institute for Le- Legislative Action uh, was John Dinkle uh, of, Miss, uh, uh, of Michigan. Uh, you know, certainly a, a, a liberal uh, in the uh, New Deal Great Society uh, uh, sense of the word, uh, and also a very strong supporter of the right to bear arms. What, one thing that I also found in To Trust the People with Arms, your book here, uh, was that when gun control is enacted and has been enacted, it, it often has been enacted to disenfranchise certain minority groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, minority groups, as we see them today, black codes in the South uh, mm-hmm. or in New York City with the Sullivan Act and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but even toward today, um, you know, talk about that for a minute, because that, that's interesting. I, I, I think that's also an illiberal thing to be doing, to go after the weakest part of society, a minority who can't afford um, maybe to live in the best zip code, can't afford private security the way so many can, and so on, that they have to then defend themselves. So if that freedom is taken from them, they are then left vulnerable. Oh, yes, I, I, I thoroughly agree. I mean, look, look at the effort uh, that was made basically to ban guns in public housing. Uh, this is unconscionable. You're taking people who are not protected uh, very well by society at all, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, in communities where the police won't come unless they can get uh, two or three uh, squad cars uh, uh, to join, and we're telling those those individuals uh, they can't have the means of self protection. Uh, there's nothing liberal uh, about, uh, and yet, um, you know, somehow, uh, you know, liberal groups and and uh, Liberal newspapers and whatnot applaud those kinds kinds of efforts. Uh, certainly, we can look at the black codes in the South and the uh, and uh, the efforts at uh, basically disarming uh, uh, black people immediately after the Civil War. Uh, New York Sullivan Act uh, was nothing but an anti-Italian measure, uh, you know. And in fact, the newspapers, including the New York Times, were filled with sort of racist screeds against uh, uh, Italian immigrants and how they had to be disowned. Uh, there's a very uh, unfortunate history or blameworthy history, perhaps I should say, uh, with respect to uh, racism, ethnic prejudice, and, and attempting to disarm people. As you teach this in the university, um, your students coming in, what are you getting from them? Do they already have a basis and understanding in this history or is this something new to them? Oh, uh, some do. I mean, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, we live in a somewhat fragmented society with respect to guns and, and other things, which is there's some people, students entering the university who are quite familiar with firearms. They grew up with firearms and, and uh, in many cases are familiar with these arguments and debates uh, for others. Uh, you know, it's a totally foreign subject. They're simply not aware of, you know, which, which is uh, interesting, uh, to say the least, uh, that, that kind of division. Well, just starting from the most basic principle of an individual right um, mm-hmm. uh, before the law and, and so on. I mean, do they come in with that, the, the, a deep understanding of the philosophy that led to our founders writing the, the, the Constitution and then adding the Bill of Rights by the first Congress the way they did? Um, or is that something they just haven't learned in high school and as they come into to your college, they, they have to learn? Well, of course, um, they haven't learned it in high school, well, by and large. And of course, most of my students are law students, so they've been to college uh, uh, before law school. Um, but even then, um, you know, not that many people are taking uh, as undergraduates, American history or political philosophy or the other subjects that might inform them uh, on some of these areas. So for some, it's new. For, some, for others, it's, it, it's not. What's the reception, though, as you, you teach this topic? Is there, is there pushback or just uncertainty or um, are they just curious? 
I think uh, for the most part, uh, uh, people are curious. Uh, and in part, uh, once again, I think there's a lack of uh, lack of training, a lack of taking class, classes, uh, or fewer and fewer, fewer students take classes that engage um, history and philosophy and, and political philosophy in particular. So for some, uh, it, it can be quite new. So one last question, because I, this is, makes me curious as well, because you are a history and law professor who's done a, a deep dive into the history of the Second Amendment with the trust of the people with arms. So you've gone through the case history and, and, and all this, and how the Second Amendment's been treated over time. But now you're also sitting in, you're, you're you know, sitting in, you're, you're presiding over classrooms with students coming in. Um, so you're on the kind of the cutting edge of, of that young thought, that next generation then uh, going out into the world um, to wield the law. Um, are you hopeful that they're getting this individual nature of America and that, that, that basis for what we are, that I think can't be articulated better than the U.S. Bill of Rights? Or are, are you not so hopeful? Where do you see things going? Well, I think, look, for the most, most of American history, I think uh, most people and uh, the courts generally recognize the right to bear arms as a right of individuals. There's a period between, I would say, the 1960s and uh, the 1990s, um, where the individual, uh, the, the collective rights view or the militia only view is at its strongest uh, because the gun control movement is just starting. The gun control movement, uh, at least in its initial stages, is actually quite honest. They say we are a gun prohibition movement. Uh, you know, they honestly say that. They don't try and hide it, I think, the way they, they do today to a great extent. You know, we're into gun safety and, and other sort of euphemisms, but, you know, uh, they're still at core prohibitionists, but uh, they've managed to package uh, what they're doing somewhat better. But from the 1960s to the 1990s, uh, you had this, uh, a gun prohibition movement that was quite frankly prohibitionist and uh, the popular press doing its best to promote the militia only view uh, of the second amendment. Um, and I think a lot of people grew up, uh, came of age, and indeed became lawyers uh, in that atmosphere. Today, they're growing up in a somewhat different atmosphere, uh, thanks also in part to, to what the courts have done, uh, where, you know, the Supreme Court now says it is an individual right. Uh, people, uh, everybody who now goes to law school and takes constitutional law, and, and everybody does, reads the new case books uh, that have to deal with Heller, McDonald, and, and Bruin. So in a sense, uh, there's a normalization on the part of people who are now going to uh, college and then going to law school, a normalization uh, from, from academia of the idea that this is an individual right. Uh, People may disagree with it. People may say, I have this criticism or that criticism uh, of, uh, uh, of, of Heller or McDonald or Bruin. Uh, but it's no longer uh, a kind of outlying, uh, outlier uh, kind of idea. By the way, I should also add, even in the 60s and 70s, at the height of uh, the collective rights propaganda, uh, from the media, the American public never bought it. That is, polling data always showed that the public saw correctly the Second Amendment as a right of an individual. Uh, the right of the people to bear arms uh, is not the right of the state to organize a militia. You know, no matter how much you want to, uh, you know, how much you want to do in terms of, uh, uh, you know, try and manipulate the, the words uh, or, or the history. Well, that's a, an interesting way to think about it and an important way to think about it. Because as, as I picture young students and what you hear today about what's going on in academia, I, I worry 
But of course, a law student would have to confront Heller and McDonald and now Bruin. Um, and just by reading that, those cases and confronting those arguments, that's, that's got to involve them. Uh, yes, I, I think it does. I think it, it, it makes a difference. Uh, certainly does. Well, tell me, where can people find your book, uh, find you, find out more about you? Okay. Well, uh, my book's available on, uh, on Amazon.com. Uh, one could also write to the press, University Press of Kansas, uh, but it's probably quicker just to simply go through, through Amazon. It's, it's been available since, uh, uh, since early October on, on Amazon. Uh, I can be found at the uh, George Washington University Law School and, uh, you know, go to its website. and They'll give you all the information about emails and so forth. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.